Good morning. Are we having fun? All ready for some fun with testing? <laughs> Exciting topic here, yes. So, uh, welcome, and uh, I want to introduce myself. I'm Richard Adama. I'm with a company called Aegis.net, based in Washington, D.C., uh, in the U.S. I'm a lead consultant there. I'm a fire certified implementer, um, and my background is a lot of years in the industry. Uh, predominantly, the last uh, five years or so has been with the fire specification. So I've actually uh, been contributing to the fire spec for about five years or so. Uh, and that gives me uh, an interesting perspective here. I'm a senior architect lead developer for our Touchdown project, which is our testing platform for fire, uh, as well as the author for our public test server called uh, Wildfire. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, within the fire specification, uh, back in DSTU 2, which was, oh, summer of 2015, roughly, uh, along with the MITRE Corporation, with the Fire Corps team, and with uh, people in my group, we uh, uncovered, unearthed uh, a little thing inside the specification that Graham had been working on and brought it up into full light, and that is the fire testing framework that we have. So I want to give a brief overview of what that framework looks like, and then we're going to start to dive into how that framework is going to be used for testing and for certification support uh, with various programs that we have that are going on right now. So some of the program support features with Touchstone uh, we're going to go over as well too for organizational groups, security, privacy, and we have uh, places to put your test scripts, your test definitions, which we call our Fire Sandbox. We're currently working with NICTUS on the MedMy uh, project, so those of in the MedMy uh, track, hopefully should be used to or familiar with Touchstone a little bit already because that's how we're supporting them with their testing. So let's dive into the fire testing framework. Uh, this is part of the specification since DSTU2 and the whole idea here is we wanted to provide a mechanism, a definition within the specification about how to test fire implementations. And so there is a testing.html page available, uh, and that describes the framework, and it makes reference to a first-class resource type now available called the test script. And that test script is really just a way to define an executable series of operations and how to evaluate them. And so we'll be taking a look at that a little bit as we go on here. Let's first take a look at our test execution workflow. So in the testing framework, we have what is, what's called a fire test engine. And that fire test engine has to follow a certain path through the processing of a test script. So there are five different steps that are going to be happening here that the test engine will execute with each given test script. There's pre-processing, setup, test, and teardown executions, and then finally post-processing. The execution steps are the ones that we have control over. The test engine is always going to be doing the pre and post processing for us. But I want to highlight a couple of those. Pre-processing is where we're going to uh, take the test script that we're executing and evaluate it against the system being tested. And we want to compare and see, am I testing what this system is capable of doing? Once we get past that, we get into setup, which is where you want to prepare the test system for whatever is going to happen next. So we could be doing creates, updates, deletes, so forth, to prepare the data. And then we get into the actual test execution, where we're going to be executing and recording the results of that test. Teardown is optional. Basically, if we want to clean up after ourselves, as we should, we always want to be uh, nice and tidy and put things back the way they were. So the teardown gives us that, uh, that capability as well. Post-processing, uh, again, the test engine is going to handle this and do some cleanup and uh, collection, data collection of the test execution. So pre-processing, as I said, the test engine is going to evaluate the test script against the system under test. And that evaluation is based on the capabilities of the system under test. So how do we know what the capabilities of the system, system under test is? Anybody? Simple answer, capability statement, thank you. So 
Capability statement, every fire test or every fire system must present a capability statement. That's part of the specification. Well, we can leverage that and we can evaluate it against the test script and the operations that are going to be performed. And we're going to make a determination. Well, if the capabilities match what we're testing, no problem, keep going. Well, what if they don't match? What if we have a mismatch? Well, the specification allows for the test engine to skip that test, if so desired, but also you can elect to continue the execution. Well, why would we want to go ahead and execute a test when we know that we're testing something that's not supported? Well, that's actually, there we go. Um, you may wish during your development process to test for functional gaps. Right? You may not uh, have everything ready, but the test itself provides testing of various operations that you do support and you want to see where you're missing you know, some functionality or you're trying to uh, work on that functionality. So in Touchstone, we actually allow you to just go right ahead and run the test regardless of what your system supports. Uh, and then we just report back to you what happened. So you can evaluate and do what we call test-driven development. Everybody he hear that term before? Yeah, so test-driven development is something that we want to promote in what we're doing here. For test execution, this is where things get interesting. There are a number of tests that will be defined within the test script. Each test is a series of actions that are going to be performed. An action can be one of two things. The operation that's going to be executed on the system under test. So that's going to be the Fire RESTful API. Create, update, delete, whatever it might be. We support all of the operations, including all those dollar extended operations within the specification. So the test script is designed to cover the breadth of the operations of the Fire specification. After the operation is executed, you then follow it with zero or more asserts. You don't have to follow it with an assert but what's the point of doing an operation if you're not going to evaluate it? So at a minimum, we generally see one or more asserts, and the assert is a rule, the expression that's going to evaluate to a Boolean. And essentially, you're taking that operation that just executed, the request, the response, HTTP headers, response code, whatever it might be, and you're going to run these expressions to evaluate whether or not it did what you expected it to do. So it's up to you to define what that assert means. And based on what you do, if it's true, we continue executing, and you pass, and so on and so forth, until you finally run into something that might potentially fail, and then the test will stop at that point, and then we'll move on to the next test. So let's actually see this in operation. And that's why I've got my screen up here, which is now, of course, timed out here. Hang on. So I'm going to bring up Touchstone. And so this is our production uh, publicly accessible site here. Uh, I'm not going to go through the process of registration and setting up a test system. I just want to demonstrate what it means to execute a test. Tests within Touchstone fall under this navigation area on the left, which we call test definitions. Now, in Touchstone, we support nine different versions of Fire. How many versions are there? Well, you, have you ever been to a Connectathon event, the HL7 Connectathons? What does Graham do for a Connectathon? He produces a snapshot version of the Fire specification. So if we wanted to support testing at the Connectathon, we need to also support those intermediate snapshot versions. So starting with DSTU2, which is actually way down at the bottom here, that 102, that's the internal version number. Uh, finally, when we got to STU3, they got the internal version numbers to sync up, and we finally went to 3. Uh, why is it 301? Well, we had a technical correction. So instead of 300, it's 301. But basically, what I've done here is I've created, in my Fire Sandbox under Aegis, I have a little section here for my Dev Days 1811. So this is our current one here, and I have Fire Testing, and these are the test scripts that I've written for the exercises that will follow after this uh, particular presentation. Basic operations, I'm just going to come over here to a read operation, and this is purely a demonstration on how it works. The test script itself, as I said, is just a first-class citizen within Fire. Sorry, back here. Uh, and the test script resource in this 
XML format uh, is the definition of what we're going to execute. Everybody loves reading XML, right? So this is perfectly fine to take a look at. But I uh, just wanted to point out, here's our action, and there's the operation we're going to perform. It's a read operation against the patient resource. We're expecting a JSON response back, and this is the resource ID that I'm going to be reading, example. I'm going to be executing this against my wildfire public server, so I'm just going to click this. I could do both of these, but um, I can select both or none or one. And I'm going to create a test setup. And in the test setup is where you actually choose what the system is that you're going to be testing. Now, people who register in Touchdown, we're going to be defining their different test systems. And you can actually make your test system in Touchdown publicly accessible to anybody else who's in Touchdown. And since I'm the author of Wildfire, I've made that publicly accessible. So you can go ahead and use Wildfire for your, uh, for your test for demonstration purposes. Uh, otherwise, just choose from the list of publicly available systems that are out there. Now, I don't like to, I don't like to test against somebody else's system. Right? That's for them to do. So I'm going to choose Wildfire, my server. There's nothing else to select here. It's just a simple read operation. So I'm going to hit ex Execute. And then we come to our dashboard of the running test execution. We'll do a manual refresh. And it's a read operation, so it happens pretty quickly. Uh, and then basically, we can drill down into the details of this. So if I had more than one test script here, I could see multiple rows of test script executions that I could take a look at. Click on this, drill down, and we get into the test script execution dashboard. And down below here is the actual single test that I had defined. And I can click and expand. And I can see that the read operation came back with a successful 200, yay. But if I want to look at the details of that test execution, we can keep expanding even further. And so we've captured everything about that exchange. So the request, now Touchdown was acting as the client in this particular example. Uh, we didn't choose an external client in this case. So Touchdown took the definition of that operation created the correct URL path to my server, my base URL, and put patient after it and example after it and did a get, because that's what I told it to do. And I told it that I wanted to send an accept header for the MIME type, the fire MIME type for JSON. And we know that care set needs to equal UTF-8. That's all part of the spec, so we're following the spec when we do this. My server sent back a 200 along with a bunch of other headers, as well as a payload, which represents the thing that I tried to read. And there it is. So there's my patient in uh, JSON format. So now I have everything I need to evaluate whether or not this worked correctly. And I'm just doing a few simple asserts down here. Was the response a 200? Was the content type header in the response JSON, the MIME type of fire JSON? It's a coded value, which is why it's JSON there. But if I expand this, I can see from the test script definition, right? that's what I'm testing for. In the response, that's the direction. I want to test that the content type is JSON. I also want to test whether or not the resource type that I got back is patient. I want to make sure I get the right resource type in my read. So these are very simple asserts that you can do. Obviously, we can be much more complex. We can use expressions, fire path, JSON path, X path, that type of thing to introspect what's going on here. But just from an execution perspective, this is how it works. So let's go back to our slides. I'll just leave that there for a moment. So now we know how to execute tests. But from a program level perspective, how do we support testing at a program level? And how do we support those certification efforts that the program might want us to do? Well. Very simply, what does it mean? It means we have an implementation guide, a fire implementation guide, that defines all of these ways that we're supposed to implement the implementation guide, right? The use cases and so forth. So the implementation guide, was anybody at uh, Lloyd's recent talk, you know, just before here? Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. We need to have human readable format of information. We need formatted text, pictures, and attachments. We need to explain to the developers how to implement this thing. So if I'm going to do, let's say, the MedMy 
uh, program's implementation guide for medication overview, I have to read that part of the specification and understand how it's going to work in order to implement it. So that means that that implementation guide has to be published and accessible somewhere, usually on a website or via PDFs or so forth. And then, most importantly, is that implementation guide provides us with our conformance artifacts from FHIR. So that means our profiles, our structure definitions, and so on and so forth. Whoops, make sure I use the right clicker here. So implementation guides can be pub uh, published in a couple of different ways. So if you're familiar with the publication process of the fire spec itself, Graham has written a tool called the IG Publisher, and you can use that, leverage it, and uh, produce, you know, basically a uh, wiki page, you know, that's generated from all of those artifacts that you put in there. Examples of that would be the U.S. core specification or Australian-based specification, uh, and you can actually see all of them on the Fire Foundation's website where we have links to the registry there. Simplifier is also another mechanism uh, presented by Fire Lee as a means to do implementation guides. So you can look to see what all the guides are that Simplifier uh, hosts under simplifier.net slash guides. Some examples there are the Canadian e-referral as well as the NICTIS MedMy program. So just as an example, this is what the US Core implementation guide looks like. This is a result of the IG publisher. What do you notice? It looks a lot like the fire spec. So if you like this look and feel, if this is what you want for your implementation guide, follow the IG publisher way of doing things. If you wanted to do something with Simplifier, well, like MedMy, then you've got, in the background, I've got the Simplifier site, the project that hosts all the conformance artifacts, and they give nice renderings of all of those profiles and so forth. But in addition, what uh, Nictus has done is they've also provided a wiki page series of information pages that describe things. So there's that medication process I kind of mentioned already. So there's a wiki page that actually has the operation definition to do that medication overview. Okay? And that's where you would go to find out exactly how you do that. So regardless of which form of implementation guide you're looking at, it's necessary to take a look at those conformance resources, the profiles, the operations, search parameters, and all the terminology that goes along with it. So these are just as an example of all those uh, fire resource types along those lines. <coughs> so another part of the implementation guide is validation. So <coughs> Validation relies on the conformance resources. And so those conformance resources, the structure definitions and so on, all feed into the validation engine. So the use of a fire validation engine, we're going to leverage either the Java reference implementation validation engine or maybe the .NET validation engine. But you can uh, download these things and you can run them independently if you wish. So you could take a resource that you feel is supposed to be conformant to a particular profile in your implementation guide and run either one of those and you can validate it. So that's what I call like just simple validation of data. You know, just look at the data as an independent static structure uh, just to validate it. Uh, what's more interesting though is when we do it from a use case perspective in the implementation guide. The use cases define, you know, things that you're going to be doing uh, at a functional level when you implement this into some type of application. Well, when you do that, you're going to follow the guidelines, the use cases, and requirements that are all defined in the implementation guide, and that's what we're going to use to build our test scripts. The test scripts follow the use cases within the implementation guide, and they can be very simple operations like what I just showed you with a read, or they could be more complex workflows that are uh, part of that implementation guide. And so we have asserts that follow the implementation guide. So you have to read that implementation guide very closely and understand what the requirements are because that's going to feed into your test definitions when you start to write them. Well, once you have test scripts, you need to be able to execute them. So right now, we can execute them with a fire test engine like Touchstone. 
the fire test engine, remember, um, is going to allow you to validate the payload. So in my particular example that I showed you, which was very simple, I didn't have any validation. Okay? I basically had a couple simple asserts just to look at the operation context, if you will. But now I'm going to be interested in actually looking at the payload of the operation. Either the request payload, so I want to validate that the client is sending me something conformant, or the response payload that the server is sending back something that's conformant. So what does validation mean? Well, the validation engine with a profile is going to be checking all of these different things about that data payload. From the structure, to the cardinality, to the value domains, bindings, invariants, and so on. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with that, but essentially there's a lot that the validation engine is going to do for you. And again, we want to be able to support that in a test engine, and we do that in Touchstone. The way we do it in Touchstone is that I've taken the Java reference you know, implementation of the validation engine, and I've incorporated that as a service to Touchstone as the, in the back end. So when you get to an assert in your test script that says validate this payload, I actually send that off as a service request to my validation engine service running in the background. And I have an instance of that validation service for every version of Fire that I support. Let's actually take a look and see how this works. So I'm going to go back to Touchdown here, and let's go to our test definitions. And so these are the test scripts that I've written for this particular tutorial. Uh, there's a section here for validation. So let's click on that. And what I have here are a couple different test scripts. Uh, one does a create operation, one does a read operation. And the reason for that is the create operation, I'm going to use that to validate the request payload. The read operation, I'm going to validate the response payload, just to show you we can do both directions. Let's actually take the create, and let's look at it first. I'm going to scroll down here, and here's our create operation with patient. And I have a fixture, which is basically the data that I'm going to be sending. And then here, I have this assert called validate profile ID. And that's going to take a profile identifier that I've defined up above here. And you'll notice that I have the canonical URL from the fire specification for the patient resource. This is just the base specification. So I'm not really doing any implementation guide type of testing yet, but I just want to demonstrate that we can just leverage the base specification as well. So this assert right here is the one that's going to evaluate the content. Now guess what? I'm sending bad content intentionally. So I know that I'm going to send a patient with some invalid data in it. So the validation engine should be able to capture that, the wrong code value or an invalid date or something like that. Uh, now what happens normally is when an assert fails, it stops execution for that operation, for that test, right? And so it's not going to execute any of the other asserts. That's just part of the workflow definition in the spec. So that means I'm not going to be able to do these other two asserts here. Well, we have a little flag here called warning only. And this might give us a chance to review what the validation errors might be while allowing the additional asserts that follow to continue uh, executing. So let's go ahead and see how this works. I'm going to choose this, create test setup, and again, use wildfire as my example. Execute, and off we go. And it passed. Well, did it really? Well, I have a pass with a W. That's that warning only flag. So even though I passed, let's scroll down here, I can see, look what my server sent back. So my wildfire server also performs validation of the payload. I sent back a 400, because you're sending me bad data. I don't want it. Well. I'm going to send back an operation outcome. You know, if I have a failure, I want to report it back to the person who sent it, right? Now, what am I evaluating here, though? I'm evaluating the payload of the request. And that's this first assert. So notice what I got back. I got this list of errors back from the validation engine based on that one assert. And so that's going to evaluate all the components of that payload. Well, what did that payload actually look like? Well, let's take a look. I have the request payload here. And so it's complaining that it doesn't like this name use code value, temporary. 
Well, remember, that's a binding in fire to a code set, to a value set of codes. And temporary is not one of the valid codes. So, boom, we got an uh, error flagged because of that. And I just inadvertently down here put in a wrong date. Okay, so the 41st day of January. Uh, so that's invalid. So there's another check that it's going to do. And it did a very nice job, and it actually gave me temporary is not in the value set, as well as um, an invalid date. And it gave me the location to it as well. Okay. So this is actually a nice way to invoke that validation engine to see if the data that you're sending both request and response is conformant. Make sense? The other one is a read operation. And I'm just going to come back over here. And now this is an example of doing a test where I'm asking for more information. Part of the definition of the test script when you want to define like a variable for use later in the test, one of those is that if I don't give an actual value to the variable, like a path expression or a default value or so forth, it's going to prompt me. So in this case, I'm prompting for a specific resource ID. And so if I know a specific resource ID on my server, whoops, wrong one, like this. So I have a valid resource with a valid resource ID of valid-1001. I'll hit execute, run, and there we go. Again, read operations, pretty quick. Come down below here, expand, and we can see here is my uh, assert here that executes the validation engine. So it's not very exciting because it was actually good. So we don't see any errors or anything. So it, a nice little green check mark, and we're good to go. Make sense? All right. Testing is exciting. Yes. OK. All right. So how do we support programs with this type of environment? So Touchstone itself has been designed initially and now uh, enhanced with features that allow us to support various programs. Uh, I'm going to use Nictus again as my uh, you know, poster child here because we've been engaged with Nictus now, for, uh, Nictus for a little while. But essentially we have things called organization groups. So you as a user in Touchstone belong to an organization. But in order to access program level testing, you may need to ask to join an organization group. So Nictus has set up some of those. Uh, security and privacy settings are then set on the test definitions, the test scripts, so that only if you belong to the org group will you have access to certain tests. And then there's a sandbox area, so I've already showed you what the sandbox area looks like. So I have one for Aegis, you know, where I can throw stuff up there for people to play with. But there's also one for Nictus as well, so you can actually, if you have access to it, uh, see what those tests look like. And uh, if you're interested in that, there's the MedMay track, uh, so come on over to the MedMay table. I've actually set up shop over there now because uh, um, I'm assisting Arden and, and then the folk over there. We also have uh, a RESTful API that we've defined for Touchstone. And the RESTful API is basically a way so that you don't have to go through the user interface. You can actually do it programmatically through some other application. The main purpose for this is if you want to do like a continuous integration build of your Fire server, and you want to incorporate calls to Touchstone to execute tests against your just built server. So we've got an API that allows you to do that. So anything that I showed you here, as far as creating a test setup, execution, and so forth, can be done through the API. We also have a Touchstone IDE. So this is our test script editor. And this is a new little feature that we've uh, put out this year. It's an Eclipse-based IDE for editing test scripts and uploading them directly into Touchstone. So uh, if you have this feature available to you, you'll be able to upload your test scripts into your own Fire Sandbox. It has integration points, obviously, with Touchstone to upload, but we also have integration point with GitHub, Subversion, and Simplifier. So Simplifier is just another registry, another repository, if you will. So we can take a Simplifier project and we can upload and download from our IDE, and then from there we can choose to upload into Touchstone. So you can leverage what you're doing with Simplifier as well, too. Uh, Wildfire, I'm the author of our public test server called Wildfire. Uh, now, just to caveat this, 
Wildfire is not a server that we sell. Okay, so I'm not selling this as a fire solution or whatever, um, you know, for your EHR, you know, environment. This is a test server to support testing. So it's a reference implementation, part of the ecosystem, the environment for, uh, for Touchdown. So as an example, Nictus has contracted with us and we've actually instantiated an instance of Wildfire for their testing purposes. So again, if you're at the MenMy table, you'll be able to access our uh, Nictus Wildfire server for all the MenMy profiles. Java Validation Engine, as I uh, mentioned before, we put that in as an internal service to, uh, to Touchdown. So, as I mentioned, we've been engaged with Nictus now since the beginning of this year. We provide training on how to use Touchstone and how to write test scripts. Uh, the Nictus staff, after I was done training them, has now taken over and they're writing test scripts. So every test script you see in Touchstone under the Nictus Firebox, uh, Sandbox I mean, belongs to Nictus. They're the authors of them. Uh, we support uh, validation of the MedMe profiles. So, um, uh, Nictus uh, with Alexander Hinkett, um, you know, has been writing profiles. Arden, I believe you're a profile editor as well, too. Uh, so once those profiles have been created, I take those all in and I upload them to our validation engine. So now we have validation of the Nictus MedMy pro profiles incorporated in there as well. Currently, we support nine different areas. So there are nine different program areas of MedMy that we support. Uh, with more coming online, I believe, in 2019. Uh, and again, the Nictus Wildfire server. So from a program support level, how do we do that? I mentioned we have something called an org group in Touchdown. So over here is just a list of the org groups, uh, and the ones specifically for MedMy are the MedMy Certify, Dev, and Testing. Now, these org groups are defined this way because for dev purposes, Aegis, Firely, and Nictus are part of the dev group. We're helping to build those tests and test them internally, so we test the test before we make them publicly available. Those that are approved from dev can get pushed over to MedMe testing. And those are publicly available test definitions that anybody can execute that are, that's given access. So those who are going to be doing MedMay testing here in the Netherlands, you can see we've got a few organizations that have already signed up. Uh, and once they go through testing, then they want to go through the actual certification tests, and those will be uh, underneath the certify group. Well, how does that work? Well, under test definitions, as I said, there is a NICTUS sandbox group. Now, remember, I belong to Aegis. Do I have rights to see testing and certify? Well, if you go back to org groups, Aegis is not on the list for access to testing and to certify. I only have access to dev. It's up to the Nictus folks to push those tests out as they see fit. So I only have access to the dev group here, and you can see there's quite a few that are available. So you can see there's the different um, programs from allergy intolerance all the way to medications and, and so on and so forth, okay? But these are all for development purposes, so I'm not going to use any of them right now in a demo because they're under development, okay? Again, go to the MedMe track table back there and uh, Arden and I can help you out with, uh, with the actual ones that you want to play around with, okay? But the idea here is that I don't have access to things that I'm not allowed to see and so from a program perspective, we can control you know, what's allowed to be visible and executable. Let me go back. So security and privacy settings, fire sandbox, and so forth are covered in what we're talking about here. Okay? And I think that's pretty much it. I want to get too far. I know we're getting close on time here. So for my purposes, uh, if you're interested in learning more about Touchstone and doing testing in Touchstone in a general fashion, I have a series of exercises that I've put together uh, that'll show you how to run through the registration process to open up an account within Touchstone. Uh, you can run through some of the basic operations like I demoed here, uh, as well as some of the more complex workflows and validation tests that I have. I even have um, a use case for MedMy 
which is the medication overview operation that I showed you, because uh, that works on the wildfire server. So I actually had to implement that operation on wildfire. Uh, and so it's actually available in, on the public wildfire server as well as the Nictus wildfire server. And finally, I just want to put a plug in. Um, I'm published now, along with some of the MITRE folks. So uh, Jason Walinowski and Rob Scanlon, myself, as well as a few others in collaboration with ONC. So MITRE, Aegis, and the ONC Office of National Coordinator have published a paper on fire testing and validation and the impact it has on the industry. So I would commend this to your reading. Uh, and so uh, I actually have the page here, so if you wanted to see what it looks like, um, you know, there's the live page for the, for the document. So please, uh, at your leisure, go ahead and give that a read. Uh, lots of fun stuff there uh, to take a look at. Again, these slides are going to be available uh, after this, so all the links will be available as well, too. And that's what I have to talk about. Um, any questions? Yes, in the back. Hello. A uh, question related to the supported version of uh, a fire server. Uh -huh. How long the, will it pass uh, from, will it take to, to have a validation testing also for release four of fire server? Yes. It's Good, good question. So uh, validation testing. So right now you'll notice that I have support for 3.5, right? So this was the snapshot release for the last Connectathon. So that's on the R4 path. Um, I just finished building yesterday successfully uh, the R4 snapshot, you know, the CI build locally. So what I do is I download the specification, uh, I build it locally, and that provides me with all the artifacts for validation. And then from there, I take all of the Java code and I build what I call my core library uh, for Fire based on that version. And then that is what I use to build out my validation engine as well as Wildfire as well, too. So I track that very closely. Uh, we're actually pretty good. So as soon as Graham releases it officially, usually within a week we'll have um, things up and running from a validation perspective. But you also have to remember, I've got a suite of test scripts out there so I'm going to be upgrading my test script as well to match that version. You know, and usually, as long as I keep up with it, that doesn't take a whole lot. Yes? Do you only support for the Eclipse ID? Eclipse ID? Yeah, so if, the... If, if yes, you, 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 do you have any plan for or support any other uh, ID like uh, Visual Studio, something like that? No, well, we, when we were talking about and de deciding how we wanted to build, so this is the IDE interface. It's just Eclipse on steroids, essentially, with a few plugins that we built, right? So I've got the XML editor. Uh, I've got some templates that I, I have for the XML editor. Uh, so we, when we were trying to decide on the platform for the IDE, we were looking at IntelliJ. At, you know, so we wanted to find a platform that would be easy from a plugin development. Uh, and so, if you looked at IntelliJ, uh, they have no documentation. It's very difficult to actually figure things out. Uh, we actually spent a week just trying to figure it out in IntelliJ. Uh, and then we went back to Eclipse, and they had much better documentation, even though they're probably not as robust in some areas. Uh, since they had the documentation, it was a lot easier to go that route. Uh, something like a Visual Studio we haven't looked at. Um, so that might be an option in the future for us as well, too. We just wanted to get a tool out there that would allow us to access um, and do what we wanted to do. So I can double click on this. There's the raw um, XML for the test script. One of the enhancements we do want to do for this is create a DSL type of language. You know, like you're familiar with Cucumber or, or that type of thing. We'd like to actually uh, do that for a test script resource. So you don't have to slog through the XML so much, but work through a more structured, simplified structure, uh, and then we'll convert it to the XML or JSON format for you, you know, for you to upload. Yes? So um, I'm just putting all of this together. Does mm -hmm. it make sense that you could possibly bootstrap the creation of these tests from the capability statement and the implementation guide? Yes, so that's actually another area. Um, now, time and resources are our enemy, so it's basically we have to pick and choose what we're gonna be working on. 
Uh, but yes, that has been something we've been talking about for a while now, is the capability statement, implementation guide is a resource type, structure definitions, all of these things uh, you know, can be used. You know, they're programmatically parsable and so forth, so we can actually take a look at those and generate probably a skeleton, a framework of test scripts. Uh, nobody has asked us to do that yet. Yes. Okay, all right, and, and we're looking for someone to help pay to do that as well, too. So, uh, but yes, we're, we're definitely interested in doing that. Um, I know that Graham actually wrote something in his server a little while ago to generate test scripts based on data. Uh, and so that's something else we might be looking at as well, too. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, how does the authorization work, uh, you know, with Keystone, uh, sorry, Touchstone trying to authorize uh, to do the basic operations against a fire server? Is yeah, that so uh, the, all the documentation for Touchstone is online here, so we have a nice... Uh, HTML documentation page area. And if you look at the continuous integration section here, so this describes the API. And so the API basically is, you know, the first thing you do is call the authenticate method. And the authenticate method takes your touchdown user ID and password, you know, as input, and then we send you back a token, you know, sounds familiar, right? Mm -hmm. That token then has a life of about 15 minutes. So as long as you keep using it, it'll keep renewing. But as soon as you stop using it, it'll expire, and then you'll just have to authenticate again before you go on to the next thing. Awesome. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you, and uh, enjoy. <laughs>